plagued by more homicides, Kansas City now offering the highest reward money in the nation. More outrage over property appraisals, now a lawsuit. What happens next? Plus, the pushback over pride. And if you thought potholes were bad, prepare yourself for the Metro's newest menace. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. It's all the local news that matters, sliced and diced and delivered straight to the comfort of your own home in less than 30 minutes. On a journey with us through the news of the week, tracking everything from hard to catch snakes to hard to pin down council members from 41 Action News, Cat Reed, doggedly following the pitchforks and torches over property appraisal. This week from KCTV5 Chief Investigative Reporter Angie Racono. Also with us is Mr. Up to Date on... on uh, KCUR FM Steve Kraske and syndicated columnist for the Tribune News Service Mary Sanchez. Uh, with no let up in homicides, Kansas City now announcing the highest reward money in the country for information that leads to an arrest in a murder case. This is an absolutely safe and invisible way for people to receive $25,000 in cash for giving us information. The reward is not taxable. You get every penny. It's $25,000 and it gets paid in cash. Is there any evidence, though, Angie, that raising reward money like this actually um, solves murder cases? Well, that kind of cuts both ways. The Kansas City Police Department is saying, statistically, when they've done this in the past and they've raised it from 2,000 to 5,000, they did see a bump. And then when they raised it to 10,000, they saw another bump. So, of course, that's the hope, that if you raise it to something as extreme as 25,000, you will see that. But then, of course, there are those cases that have huge rewards, and you know people out there know stuff, and they don't step forward. So maybe a dollar amount won't help. But, of course, we all... Hope it does. Last year on your station, Cat Reed, I saw it. Last year they went from 5,000 to 10,000. Clearly that wasn't sufficient. You know, I think this has been a kind of a goal for a long time now because they're trying to model it after Omaha, which says that after they raised the reward amount, they ended up with a 90% solved rate on their homicide cases. So it's been something that they've looked at, just wondering how do we pay for it? And the answer to that is they're going to continue doing private donations, but the city will be making up the difference of this reward increase. Steve. Now this just strikes me as such an interesting moment, Nick. $25,000 is a lot of money. And it suggests to me that this is one more indication of you know, the fractured relations between the, the police department and many of the citizens, particularly on the east side, who have told us for years they don't trust the police department. To have to go to $25,000 to encourage people to do what they should do as good citizens anyway is just a remarkable moment. I hope it helps. I think it's a good step because we need to do something to decrease the number of homicides in this town. But it also says something about the work the police department has to do. And for all the um, talk about trying to solve crimes, reduce homicide rates. Is this an acknowledgement, Mary, that all of those strategies are not working? They will always try something new and something else. I, I will say, though, in the past, the last time they raised it, a lot of the conversations that I had with KCPD, they did say that you would be surprised how many people phone in tips and then refuse the reward. Now, granted, that was at a lower level. And I know, you know, community policing, they've got to build that. And they know that you solve crime with the help of the community. I don't think this little bump that they've received will necessarily play out for the long term in terms of a, around the money. They've, it's about community relations. Indignation and alarm rises over those property appraisals that landed in your mailbox. Homeowners in Jackson County angry and demanding answers. And we're not going to stand for it. We're not. There is a mistake here. That's what they put erasers on pencils. Use them. It's a city at war. It's a county at war with its own residents who have been here for decades. We want the opportunity to work with you. We want to make sure that we get this right. This is not the county against our taxpayers. Some snapshots, voices and faces from your reporting, Angie Racono over at KCTV5. You've been looking at this all week. But right at this moment in time, is there anything you can actually do about to, uh, property appraisals in Jackson County? People can. They can still go before the Board of Equalization. 
They have until July 7th to do so. But what I find amazing is that how condensed this process has been. A lot of people got their assessment notices late, and at the very top it says this is not a bill. So you wonder how many people really didn't fully read that notice and fully understand what's going on. And it's such a short period in which they can actually appeal for help and say, hey, I think this is wrong. And when you look at how they actually did this assessment, there's a lot of concerns because it appears to be incredibly uneven. Some areas just incredibly spiking across Jackson County. But we have Jackson County officials saying uh, we will fix mistakes. We have so sure. many tens of if thousands you point of these. Them out, if you point them out, but how many people aren't going to point them out? And that's what's interesting is you have people from the neighborhood stepping forward saying, look, I know, I read it, I'll do it, but what about everybody else where you screwed up and you made a mistake? What I really find interesting about the story, too, is how many people have called us here at the station saying, what is the new mayor-elect, what is the city council going to do about this? <laughs> city Hall has nothing to do with this, right? This is a Jackson County, county-level service. This isn't their gig, but certainly anyone in elected office can put political pressure on someone to do something. Like, but what the city hall has no role, do they? No role here. But what strikes me as interesting here, Nick, is that Gail McCann Beatty, the county assessor we just saw on the tape here, she says she's been charged with doing this job the way it's supposed to be done, with with rendering accurate uh, assessments of what a property is actually worth. I don't know about where you live. I live on the Kansas side, and my house is never appraised for what I can sell it for. That's you don't right. hear people complain when they've been under-evaluated, but now we're, we're seeing these numbers go up to what she thinks they're worth, and there's this great outrage. She also points out that it's up to political officials, the elected officials, to adjust these downward if that's what's required here to satisfy public demand. You had one house that was worth um Nine hundred thousand dollars, and, and it was being evaluated for forty-five thousand. But what's important is a viewer, and thank God for the viewers who've been sending me things. You actually have a Jackson County property assessor knocking on the door. Yeah. So it's not like, hey, we missed this property. You were there. Somebody snapped a picture, and they saw it. What's interesting is Gail McCann Beatty has not been able to explain methodology public. She's like, oh, we use this. This is our formula. Mm -hmm. But when she was in a meeting on Thursday, and they said, what was the methodology? Explain it to us. She wanted two weeks to prepare that answer. But she's been doing it for months. Mm. And so finally, it was like, okay, I'll tell you next week. Sure. She should be able to answer that question right now. We also invited her onto our sister program, Rucka. She was unavailable to be okay. part of that program. But Mary, I was looking through um, the headlines from years past. There have been dozens of headlines very much like this one on both sides of state line, Wyanoke County, Johnson County, people tearing out their hair over property appraisals. How is this different or is it different? I don't think it is. And that is part of the problem. This is a frustration that has gone on for years in this jurisdiction and also around the country. It is an issue that we need to get our handle, hands around. And for the politicians to just kind of say, well, we don't know how this is happening. The other issue with the assessor is that MLS. They I know. didn't I, have I didn't access to the yes. MLS, and it would have cost less than, what, $2,000? $2,000. And how I was can told you do that? that, well, we didn't have access. It wasn't our fault. And the Realtors Association was like, mm -hmm. uh, 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 uh. She could have she could have signed up for it for two thousand mm, dollars. So there's been yes. a lack of honesty and transparency as we're trying to kind of unweave the basket of what has been yeah. done. What pressure though is really on elected officials in Jackson County over this? Frank White, the Jackson County executive, was just reelected last year with mm -hmm. around about 63, 64 percent of the vote. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think they're just waiting for this to go away. And they do in the fall, you know, the elected officials will, will find out the set levy rates and how much people will actually be paying in taxes. I think the difficulty, as Angie mentioned, is people get these estimates and it says this is not a tax bill, but how off is that really? You know, how much mm -hmm. will you be paying? And we sure. won't really know until the fall. If you thought potholes were bad, prepare yourself for our Metro's newest menace. Heavy rain has unleashed a new and dangerous phenomena on Kansas City streets. Welcome to 20 feet deep sinkholes. This has closed Gillum Road, just east of the Midtown Costco, this entire week. It seems totally unbelievable, never mind screwing up your tires or your steering. This could swallow up your entire vehicle. In fact, more than one. Uh, the city is claiming this is due to water building up in depressions and potholes in the road. Is there more to it than that? 
Listen, we have had a ton of rain mm -hmm. this spring, and that puts a lot of pressure on the roads. I will say that Mayor Lex Quinton Lucas did tweet out a picture of this and say, I told y'all we needed to fix the roads. <laughs> so uh, we will be seeing a lot of repairs happening this spring, this summer. Um, but, you know, sometimes these things happen when you have an, un or, you know, an extraordinary amount of rain. But they still haven't fixed the potholes. And I see even last month they were still filling 16,000 potholes in Kansas City, Missouri alone. That hasn't been solved yet. It hasn't been solved. And as a guy who rides his bike to work more days than not, Nick, I see those things out there. And those things could send me uh, over Fine. tea kettle there if I'm not careful. And just for the record, my two sons live near the, the sinkhole on Gillum Road. And so I'm watching this story very closely. That thing was scary. Yeah, well, huge. It is scary. Well, there are problems, of course, with crime, with trash collection, potholes, and now big sinkholes shutting down entire streets in the city. But are our mayor and city council still deserving of a pay raise? A new proposal at City Hall would hike pay for members of the city council from the low 60s to more than $70,000 a year. And the mayor's salary would go up from the 120s to $141,000 a year and change. Who's behind the latest move, Ken? Councilman Jermaine Reed is proposing this. He's an outgoing member of council. So under the city's charter, the current city council cannot raise its own salary, but they can adjust it for a future council. The thing that's a little bit awkward about this is that seven people yes. who are currently on yes. the council are going to be rolling over. They'll still be there in August, so they would be voting on their own pay raises. And even they feel uncomfortable with that. You know, I interviewed Councilman uh, Heather Hall, and she said, I don't like that. I know that it's not illegal, but, you know, there's a conflict of interest there, and I don't feel comfortable. One of the arguments was that this is a part-time job. It only pays 60 something thousand dollars a year, but that's more than most people's full-time salaries in Kansas City, Angie. That's true. That's absolutely true. But then you could also argue that maybe more people then could devote more time. If they had, you know, a better salary, they could afford to spend more time on city council. You know, and this the won't be a popular answer, Nick, but these folks work hard. They, they are always on, even if it, even though it's a part-time job on the city council. And uh, it, this is not a 20 or 30 hour a week job. It extends way beyond that. I should point out that, you know, council members in Milwaukee, 73,000 bucks a year, Minneapolis, 99,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Having said that, other cities pay less. Uh, you know, Nashville is uh, 37,000. St. Louis is is something like that too. So, but I, I don't begrudge folks for making more money for all the work they do. But the mayor of Overland Park, Carl Gerlach, makes thirty-two thousand dollars a year. Is he working uh, any less hard than these city council members? I think that everyone is working extremely hard. Public service is not something you get in for the salary. But I will mm -hmm. say that you also have to look at: Are these jobs considered part-time or full-time? So, for instance, Minneapolis, ninety-nine thousand—that's considered a full-time job. So, the part-time jobs, Nashville is is 23,000 and St. Louis 37. So we are quite a bit higher than other cities that consider it a part-time job, but they have a lot of responsibilities. Not every council meets every single week. And as you point out, there are a lot of aggravations with being in public service. I did notice that the mayor of Lexington to the east of us here in Kansas City resigns this week absolutely beside himself because of all of the negativity he's getting online. So being a public servant today has a lot more headaches than it used to, Mary. Absolutely, because of social media. Media. You can be trolled, you can be attacked in ways that wasn't quite as predominant as, you know, in past eras. And that, that's very true, but that's also part of the job. I do think no one in Kansas City is getting a raise. Thankfully, they are all smart enough that they have said, generally the council members as well as the incoming mayor, no, we're not going to take this because they know there are so many frustrations right now with the population and it just would not play well. You know, there's ways to deal with this, Nick. You could set up a salary commission that would set up, uh, establish these numbers outside of the council. You could make the pay raise effective four years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, you could you put in an automatic COLA cost of living raise every, every year so you don't have to come back every few years when these numbers get out of whack. And there are some fixes people have suggested. Scott Wagner said that he would be supportive if it started in 2023. So it's not impacting sense. anyone who would be voting on it. Um, there exactly. used to be a yearly raise that was removed back in 2011. So that used to be something that they did. I will say uh, one returning member did tell me he is in support of voting on the raise. Uh, Councilman Lee Barnes said that he is supportive of it. Coming up next, we're coming to the end of Pride Month that comes with major milestones and some pushback in the Metro.
This week, the state of Kansas became the 48th state in the nation to allow transgender residents to change their gender on their birth certificates. In Kansas City, history is made as hundreds gather for the first Kansas City Trans Pride March. All over the city, buses and streetcars are emblazoned with the pride flag. But for all the advocacy, there's pushback too. Unhappiness in Olathe about a decision by the city council to not move forward with an ordinance prohibiting discrimination against the LGBT community. Community. We're talking about basic rights. It tells us that we matter less. Meanwhile, in Independence, Missouri, Confederate flags are displayed on the lawn of City Hall to protest a move by the Independence mayor to fly the rainbow flag. That flag does not represent me. I keep hearing that it's for everybody. It does not. That represents people who have surgically removed part of their anatomy because they don't know what kind of bathroom to go to. That is not me. I am normal. Ricono, you were covering that story. So yeah. what happened since? Did they take down the pride flag? Uh, no. The man, no, no okay. the mayor. I mean, she actually tweeted out a picture. She put one on Facebook and said, I love the view. You know, her point is, is that she's trying to be inclusive. She put up the flag. And then you have a part-time janitor taking her on, saying, well, if you can put up this flag, what about my Confederate flag? So it was an interesting issue on, you know, who can bring what to work. And, right. and as we just heard in that video, pl plenty of people were applauding that. So he's not the only one who feels that way, Mary. Absolutely. I think this is a very good example in a very harsh way mm -hmm. to everyone who thinks that change happens quickly. And everyone who, when they saw that gay marriage became um, legal across the United States, was like, oh, this just happened overnight. Today is the anniversary of Stonewall, of the riots in New York, that really is said to be, you know, where a lot of the gay and lesbian activism began. It actually began way before that, but that, that's the marker in time. And here we are still arguing over this, and some people still holding that man has, has every right for his opinion. But some of the things that he said are just blatantly false. You know, just quickly, Nick, the evolution of these anti-discrimination ordinances is, is interesting to me. A lot of America's big cities have already dealt with this. Yes. Uh, more liberal people tend to live in the cities than maybe in some, some of the suburban areas. Now the battlefield has moved to the suburbs, and that's what we're seeing play out now in Olathe and Independence and many of the communities in Johnson County. And like Overland Park and Leewood and yes. Lalexa and Absolutely. Shawnee also not passing these ordinances at this point in time either, can't. No, that's right. There's been a lot of stops and starts. Some cities have, others haven't. And there is frustration because for some people, it seems like something that would be rather easy to pass and, and move forward on. Many of you may have watched the first Democratic presidential debates this week. While that was in Miami, election 2020 is finally winding its way through Kansas City. Mayor Pete, Pete Buttigieg, will be in town for a private fundraiser July 16th. No details yet on other events. With the first debates now underway, some wondering what role will Kansas and Missouri play, if at all, in the outcome? Steve Kraske, I see Missouri will weigh in March 10th. Kansas, not until the first week of May. What role will we play first in Kansas? Well, and that's a way of saying not much of really? one, Nick. Okay. Kansas is coming at the tail end of this long parade of states having primaries and caucuses. May, I think, is the second to last state you can even have one of these things. So poor Kansas won't be playing much of a role. What about Missouri? Uh, Missouri's a little earlier. They're going to be March 10th. But even that is after Iowa, New Hampshire, the Super Tuesday states uh, a week before uh, Missouri's. So Missouri's like in the fourth or fifth tier here. So it'll matter. We may see some candidates, but it's going to be pretty spot. Mary, too. please don't tell us we're going to be totally inconsequential. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we will be. And I do think, um, I mean, in terms of like the broader electoral process, that may be the issue here. They are changing, looking to change some things in Kansas, though, to change how the primary yes. so that more people they're hoping will actually play a role. The thing that I thought was interesting was lowering the age so that someone, a young person who is, will be 18 by the time of the election in November can go ahead and play a role if they go go forward with the new process of how they manage. They're also doing rank choice voting, yes. so they're actually not doing a caucus, a primary, where you get to go from one, two, three, four, five in your priority list of the candidates. Does that mean also we won't see the results immediately? Now it'll take days because they have to tabulate all of this, Ken? I think this will actually be a more streamlined process. I, it will take some time to, to calculate this, but instead of having people in a room um, going from 
from yeah. one side to the next, you know, and sometimes a room that's not even big enough to hold everyone. This will be much easier. You can show up, you can put your vote in, you won't have to stand around for hours. Kansas expects, I called over there yesterday in preparation for a Kansas City Week in Review, and they said that <laughs> they would have expect. results the next day by 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I did also notice, you know, next year is going to be a governor's race in Missouri. It'll be a U.S. Senate race in Kansas. Does that have any influence whatsoever on the presidential election, or are they totally separate? Well, they're separate, but everything ends up playing together, and... Uh, yeah, th those candidates will campaign together in some cases. It will draw more attention to the presidential races, to the governor's races. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I did notice this week that Dave Lindstrom, a former Kansas City Chiefs player, former yes. Johnson County Commissioner, now on the Johnson County Board of Trustees at the Community College, getting into the race for the U.S. Senate. That's like the 15th candidate or so who's interested in taking over Pat Roberts' seat in Kansas for the U.S. Senate. Almost as many people to keep track of as for the Democratic <laughs> nomination. Um, yeah, I think that we'll see this start to intensify in the coming months. Right now, it doesn't really feel like campaigning has fully kicked in, but we will see that soon. But we still have all the yard signs still out there for the mayoral election, so <laughs> I do. think it will just be a completely... <laughs> we'll be continuing on until 2020. In other political news, by the way, Kansas Governor Laura Kelly ordering flags at half staff in honor of former Kansas Congresswoman Jan Myers. Before Sharice Davids, before Kevin Yoder and Dennis Moore, the Kansas 3rd District was represented by Jan Myers. Jan Myers helped to get this new federal courthouse here in Kansas City, Kansas. Jan Myers helped secure funds for the interchange at I-35 and 119th. I'm Congresswoman Jan Myers. It's an honor and privilege to serve you in Washington. Congresswoman Jan Myers, getting the job done. Uh, vintage campaign commercials from Jan Myers, dead at the age of 90 of heart disease. Mm -hmm. What was the significance, Steve? Well, I think she'll be remembered mostly, Nick, as a pioneer for women. She was the first woman to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from Kansas. She was the first woman to chair a committee in Washington in the House for several decades. So I think that's how she's going to be remembered. At one point, Nick, Kansas had the unique distinction of having a female governor, U.S. Yes. Senator in uh, Nancy Kassebaum and Jan Myers from, from Congress. So it was a moment for, for Kansas. I actually came to Kansas City when Jan Myers Myers was the Kansas Congresswoman. She, w she was quiet and she wasn't the flashy type, Mary. No, no she wasn't and she was of her generation. Um, I think trailblazer though, do you know as Steve said, yes. definitely. And she also does pattern though how most women get into politics and that she wanted to start at the community level. She wanted to become more involved in the community and then she just kept on rolling. Yes. She also has that distinction of what a good public servant does is that they leave a legacy that you can see. I was just at the uh, Symphony in the Flint Hills, and I did not know when I was reading back about her history that she had actually helped save that prairie, the tall grass prairie. Her proudest accomplishment, she said, uh, as she looked back on her yeah, career. I didn't even point. realize yeah. that. So that, I mean, that's a legacy. That is a public servant mm -hmm. done well. What's your favorite festival in Kansas City? For many of us, it's the Renaissance Festival. Just as organizers get ready for this year's event, an executive with the festival is put on leave, and several former and current cast members are being investigated for inappropriate relationships with minors. If there are credible accusations of sexual assault, are the police investigating, Angie? I'm not quite sure what the police are doing, but it's clear that the executives and the people in charge of the Renaissance Festival are investigating that, and the hashtag that's been trending with this is no more broken stairs. So it's older men taking advantage of younger women who are trying to join the festival, work there, have a part-time job, and then it turns into some sort of a nightmare. That starts so, at the last week of August. Is there any, is not going to impact the start of this year's festival, no. Kat? The festival will go on, and I will say police are investigating an incident from last summer, and they did tell people if you've been a victim to come forward, whether or not those cases would actually move yeah. forward remains to be seen. Yeah. Oftentimes in those cases, you'll have a statute of limitations. Right. You'll have the issues of not enough uh, hardcore evidence. To me, though, it was the reminder that young people, when they first enter the workforce, are very vulnerable for numerous reasons. And they're often working jobs where it's a number of young people supervised by some older people, mm -hmm. and that can unfortunately a bad apple, that's a nice term for it, can get in there and cause some problems and the young person might not feel like they have a voice to stand up for themselves and say something. They're fearful of losing their job, they're fearful of the, you know, there's just a hierarchy. So uh, these cases are important. 
And finally, a trip down memory lane. Casinos have become a fixture on both sides of our state line, but it was 25 years ago this very week that the first casino in our metro opened its doors. Nearly 650 people ventured into Riverside to take part in the official maiden cruise of the Argosy Riverboat Casino. It's hard for people to remember this, but these casinos could only operate on the water right, so they would take you on a two-hour cruise down the river, Steve. Those were the days, and what an impact <laughs> they've had on communities like Riverside, where uh, casino money has helped rebuild infrastructure, streets, curbs, gutters, sewers, the whole thing. It has changed uh, life for folks in Riverside. But I was yeah. part of the conversations and the debates that were taking place back in the uh, 90s when this first started, and it was almost going to be Armageddon. It was going to destroy <laughs> yeah. our neighborhoods. We're going to have walking zombies addicted to gambling, walking our streets. What has been the impact? No, that hasn't ha happened, I no, hope. No, and you see a lot of positives, but you also see in areas, because I'm from north of the river, where you have communities that have won, but then the other communities that are nearby, they're yes. full of pawn shops and check into cash and things like that. It has changed some things for the good, but some people still argue that you do see some of those elements that come in when you bring in gambling in casinos. And one of the big pushes, of course, for allowing gambling in the first place 25 years ago, it's going to improve our schools and education. So if it wasn't for gambling, we would see all of these closed, shuttered schools, boarded up windows, people <laughs> using abacuses instead of computers, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently we do not. So okay, all right. <laughs> that did not play out as well. Um, I do think Riverside is just a great example, though, yeah. of how the city government and the officials there took the reins and made sure that that money went to things that actually would help Riverside. I was floored by the fact that they don't pay, they don't have the property taxes. Yeah. As we go back to the excessor, you know, and people worrying about ta taxes, but because they have such a slush fund. And uh, Kat, uh, the latest frontier, though, because this is insufficient, we now have to have sports betting. What is happening in Kansas and Missouri with that? Well, I think it's something we're going to see come up a, a lot of debates countrywide. Some states have already passed it. Um, I don't know where the current debate stands in well, Kansas I, and Missouri. My so. sense is that Missouri and Kansas are sort of taking their collective time to see how this plays out. There's been a lot of infighting over this. Just eight states have it. They want to do it right in our state. And now. that is our Week in Review. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.